Okay, I'm just going to start. All design arts and uh, all arts and design school in the world during the age of COVID-19 have had to develop various methods of teaching students, although they have have not been a one size fits all solutions. Various form of complete or partial online learning has been in effect for almost two years. When the pandemic ended, and we hopefully soon, educators will have to decide how to integrate at least some of the new methods with the old. These methods have a lot, but include remote uh, learning, hybrid learning, asynchronous learning, and free classroom. I guess all of us has been through strict lockdown when there's no one is allowed to leave our place, except for essential going out like getting food or medical care. I remember having to move my in-person studio class to online learning in 2020. I had to adjust my teaching style and class activities to adapt to the world of online learning. Students have also need to change their physical design outcome, such as installations, publications, physical publications into design concept, which is really sad, but because there's no shops, print shops that's open or material shop that is open during that period. As for hybrid learning or blended learning that we call it, it has been the name for the game in many schools since 2020, with some learning taking place in physical classroom and some via online learning, it wasn't a choice for most as much as a necessity, but it does mandate that educator and student become comfy and creative with both in person and online learning. Some expert thinks that even as school get back to normal, these are benefits, there are benefits to continuing to use hybrid methods at its best. It should combine positive elements of in class, uh, in classroom and remote education to give students the best of both worlds. Asynchronous learning means that learning takes place at all different times for students enrolled in a course. Typically, instructor will provide a learning path that students can explore at their own pace. This approach is built around students rather than the course, has many benefits, including more equality among students who may have difficult, a different degree of Wi-Fi access, and a lack of long lectures that can be difficult for students to focus on. The biggest advantage is likely that is take into account that every student is different and have their own strength, witness, and learning style. Lastly, there is a method that incorporate all the mentions learning and try to use all of them in their best advantage. Flip classroom is not a new phenomenon. They has become part of educational discussions and, why, and are widely used in some schools, especially medical schools, such as in N at NTU. Flip learning is um, learning essentially read just the traditional mode of teacher teach student at school, and then the student apply the contents learned in their homework after school to look like. Teacher provides students with contents to learn on their own in advance, and then teacher and student apply it together in the classroom. Again, this sorry, this COVID-19 pandemic presented a unique opportunities for us, educator and students, to reflect on the future of design education. We have realized that it is possible and sometimes desirable to do things differently, which open the door to new options and provide the poten potentials for us to reform design education. So how our design educators are adapting or even innovating in this area of digital technologies and teaching. Also, how are design students adapting to various methods of online learning as well as virtual classrooms? What are the, what are the challenging aspects to consider when design an online learning environment? Firstly, there are man, many challenges we face when moving in-person class uh, to online. Today, I'm just going to pick and present three challenges for bringing design lesson into the digital realm. Based on the initial review and discussions with students and educators who are feeling the impact, the main issue pointed to the social context of learning and how students are often overwhelmed 
by the massive amount of information they need to process. Also, the needs for design educator to upskill. Learning in the social context usually refer to all learning that occur in and among groups of people. Art and design students can develop remarkable artistic skill in design, photography, videos, making, and even sculpture through online courses. Students can discover new methods and techniques to advance their artwork. However, online courses require collaborations and coordinations among students. Online learning cannot, can be hard to facilitate groups work. The review showed that some instructors felt challenged by getting students to communicate with one another online, or some students unwillingly to share their work with groups online, and some students have difficulty understanding the iterative process of design. The challenge of getting students to speak up or engage in feedback process is even more prominent in some countries such as Singapore. For instance, most of my students are already considered um, very quiet in in-person class, and even more so if you teach online. Most of them will not even turn on their camera. I just feel like I'm talking to myself most of the time. I believe some of you may have the same feeling too. In addition, sharing ideas with peer and bouncing ideas off each other are key features of design studio education. This social component was missed by students in a strictly online classroom. Design by its very nature is a collaborative enterprise and an online deliver make the human aspect of their equations more difficult to deliver. As a result, some students felt isolated, confused or frustrated. Therefore, we educator, if another pandemic happened next time, we can consider using specific teaching strategy to foster and guide communications online, including the role of questionings, group work and manage this course. Also, in order to strengthen, reinforce and refine students' learning by encouraging students to work collaboratively to assess, to assist one another and to take on an expert, uh, expert roles. Here are two strategies for your considerations. One of them is the participatory creativities by Edward Klebs. Klebs detail the importance of collaborations between individuals and build a model of creativities that result from the collective efforts of society and focus on the processes through which ideas evolve rather than a more traditional view which attributes of a product to an individual. The other is a more advanced technology, which is the TPEC, Technological Pedagogical Contents Knowledge Models. Some design educators have used TPACs to analyze user data according to personal um, situations, improve student learning experience and performance, and enhance creativities by expanding you know, the scope of design practice. The other challenge is the massive amount of information in the learning context. We have to acknowledge that learning online and in-person is different especially with siblings and other family members at home, not to mention the distractions of televisions, video games. Therefore, we should break down lectures into bite-sized pieces to keep our students engaged and try to find a shorter videos or crafty assignment that students can complete quickly. Here are some suggestions by educators to improve the online delivery of courses were made. Real-time lectures that are streamed live must come with more information on the presentation slide rather than just images that will be explained in the lectures because they might want to uh, review it later. Um, show examples of concepts and discuss. Make video a little bit more interactive and interesting. Make sure the viewing platforms allow for video to be reasonable size. Sometimes it's really so small that you can only view it in full screen. You know, you try to like view it and do some homework, but that don't allow it. And also offer video speeding adjustment uh, settings. So, you know, some people just like it slower or faster. Lastly, other design uh, educators sufficiently trained and committed to offer eff effective instructional support to students online. 
The review show a need for educational institutions to invest time and money into professional development for their design educator to make a transition to more technological enhanced design education as smooth as possible. Also, design educator must understand how mobile, global and virtual social network influence students or even our interpretations of social cultural theories of learning. Can allow us to, this can allow us to better understand the interplay of context within which learning occur and by doing so, better understand how online learning may be facilitated. To sum up, more research is needed definitely to engage students in online art and design courses. Online courses allow students to collaborate with others if we do it right, negotiate from multiple perspectives, and share information and experience. Instructors must upskill and establish a clear path that helps students to stay motivated, interact successfully, and engage in independent knowledge buildings. From the review, many instructors have mentioned branded courses and also free classroom as the best way forward. It seems like fully online learning may not be the future of design education yet. Here, I would like to share my experience of using a free classroom to teach uh, research projects. Around the world, free educations where students consume pre-recorded lectures on their own, while classroom is used for discussions and practice is an ongoing trend. This is like a low hanging fruit in terms of technology adaptions for many institutions. It's really a, um, could optimize both student and teacher time. So let's take a shot. Every day, thousands of teachers deliver the exact same lesson in class to millions of students. Every night, millions of students sit over the exact same homework, trying to figure out how to solve it. The flipped classroom is turning this upside down. Traditionally, Students listen to lectures and take tests in class and read textbooks and work on problem sets at home. In flipped teaching, students first study the topic by themselves, typically using video lessons on YouTube, and then apply the knowledge by solving problems and doing practical work in class. Modern schools who flipped their classroom report many benefits. One, it allows all students to learn at their own pace as videos can be watched again. Two, it's more efficient as students enter the classroom prepared to contribute. Three, it enriches the classroom as more time can be spent on group work and projects. Four, doing homework in class allows students to help each other, which benefits both the advanced and less advanced learners. Flipping also brings changes for teachers. Traditionally, teachers engage most with the confident students who ask questions. Flipping allows teachers to target the students who really need help, instead of just those who are confident. Also, instead of instructing from the front, teachers guide on the side. This allows them to work more closely with individuals or small groups. Teachers that are not great presenters can use third-party videos to explain the concept and focus on methods of teaching that suit their style, such as project work or experiments. Once video lectures are made available online, teachers don't need to give the same lecture over and over again. Again, they gain more time to focus on the needs of their class. Many scholars also argue that the flipped classroom model promotes equal learning opportunities, as all kids get the same attention when doing their homework um, research has suggested that you know, free classroom is an effective uh, way to develop both independent and collaborative learning uh, ability, as well as promoting student um, engagement and enjoyment through facilitating uh, opportunities to engage in active learning with feedback and guidance provided by an expert. Although I'm not an expert in the approach of flipped classroom yet, I have experienced it for three classes so far. This method uh, suit me really well in terms of because I'm a better a tutor than a lecturer. 
Okay, the courses that I'm going to present here is CC006. It's a university core curriculum that focuses on sustainability in social, uh, society, economy, and environment. The course aims to inspire a long-lasting mindset of awareness, critical thinking, curiosity, and collaborative across discipline to the lens of cu uh, current sustainability challenges by learning how to analyze sustainability issues from different perspectives and on different scale, including individual, organizational, Singaporeans, and global. Students will then use this skill to discuss and propose solutions for sustainability challenges facing Singapore and the world. Ultimately, we want students to develop an awareness for and a system thinking approaches to sustainability. So the course will run from 13 weeks in this free classroom model, record lectures, uh, record lectures as a videos and other contents is provided for students to prepare for their in-person tutorial. So there is a weekly uh, pre-tutorial quiz that embedded in the video provided immediate individual feedback to students on their knowledge and preparedness for the tutorial. Then when they come to class, they will be involved in a, a variety of team learning activities and um, direct interactions with the instructors and among peer themselves. There will be one um, kind of online big quiz that students will come together to take the quiz that will conduct in around week 10. It helps students to consolidate their content skill before work on the group projects. Next, the group um, project outline is then presented in class and it will both be peer reviewed and marked by the instructor. The student will receive feedback in time to actually uh, make improvement for their final reports based on the same uh, group projects. The peer review is actually to promote student awareness of their own level of work as well as that of their peer. Here, um, class discussion and exercise provide an opportunity to really test um, their projects and compare and develop ideas before they submit their final paper. So a typical um, class will look like this. Every week we'll discuss a different topics. This week, um, this week that uh, passed um, on Monday, the topic is on water ability and sustainability management of water resources. Before class, the student will watch the um, lecture video um, that is on um, the, the right side and read reading material and prepare their assignment. And this is how our free classroom look like. Students sit in a round table or a table for easy discussions. There's a mic on the table. So when they speak, they actually, there's a camera that will project them on the various TV. So the whole class can see them. So in this week uh, tutorial, the focus in, is on managing uh, transboundary water conflict between the country within the Mekong, uh, Mekong River. Students start by having role play. Namely, students will imagine their group as the leader from different country and attempt to solve real world issues with the interests and perspective of their assigned country, including China, India, Bangladesh, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And we use Padlets for class tutorial. And you can see from the screen, the first four panels of the Padlets are they discuss as a country. So here is the Indian uh, uh, discussions, India uh, groups discussions. In the country discussions, students will prepare a policy statement that contain their country stance and critical issues they, that they want the meeting to focus. This policy statement will become their collective group opening speech and they will present it to the class. The last panel that you can see cluster B discussions is the discussions which consists of seven groups representing each country. They are tasked to write a resolutions with other country that they will be working with. Country must discuss to find common ground, compromise if they must. Then the student write down their suggestions in the form of the causes of a resolutions. Flip classroom, same as any learning methods have its advantages and of course disadvantages. Here, Catherine Putens lists the following among the advantages of a free classroom. Students learn a subject matters at, at their own pace. 
classroom can be used effectively and creatively. Doing homework, that's mean group projects or class activities in the classroom can give instructors a better understanding of student difficulty and learning style. Instructor can more easily customize and update lesson and make them available to students at any time. Instructor who use the methods of report, improve student achievement, interest, and also time um, um, kind of engagement. The use of te technology is flexible and appropriate for 21st century learning. Following Herright and Stella, survey over 15,000 members of National Center for Case Study Teachings and cited additional reasons for using free classroom. There's more time to spend with students on authentic research. Students who miss class for external activities you know, could watch the lecture well on road, you know, when they need to go on like sports or debates or things like that. Students are more actively involved in the learning process. The methods of promoting uh, thinking inside and outside of the classroom. And most importantly, students have reported that they really enjoy, you know, a free classroom kind of structure. So in this more open teaching and learning environment, the role of design faculty have shifted from you know, teaching to facilitator. Students will take on the role of lead designer throughout the process of exploring and experimenting with their design. They will play an important role in the development of knowledge, idea, and concept. So in order to push students beyond their core discipline, interests, passion, and even creativity, design faculty have to wear many hats of a facilitator. We should guide students through real life uh, practical exercise, provide support for students to be ethical and critical about their own performance and that of others. And of course, we have to offer a clear state for students to design for complex situations and speculate on the future. Next, I would like to touch on what is out there for design educator to teach effectively in a virtual environment. As the world progresses, the role of design educator, we should go beyond basic teaching to really assisting students in learning and applying knowledge in practical situations. For example, in a world that relies on ever um, evolving technology, the demand for design faculty with digital skill to match is also increasing. We have heard about STEM, but how many of us know about SMAC? These digital buzzwords are here to stay, whether we like it or not. So we may need to provide capability beyond emerging technologies such as AI, the Internet of Things, and data science. We must be able to adapt and need to respond to the multitudes of challenges and possibility that come with this. There are many text tools that we can use. Just like I just now uh, explained about the Padlets, and there's also WoodClap to facilitate uh, discussion, Slack for communications, and Miro for presentations. Today, I'm going to introduce some resources on AR and VR, as they are some of the technology that design educators from the lead review might want to explore for their own teachings or for students to use it in their projects. So before looking into the benefits of AI and VR in education, let's define what VR is and how it's different from AR. AR is used on a smart device to project a layers of educational text and lesson appropriate contents on the top of a user actual environment, providing students with interactive and meaningful learning experience. Well, VR create a fully digital environment, a 360 degree immersive user experience that feel real. In a VR setting, students interact with what they see as they were really there. In addition to providing students with Im 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 immersive learning experience, other benefits of VR in education in include the ability to inspire student creativities and spark their imaginations. And this can motivate them to explore new you know, um, um, design interests. So the benefits of VR and AR in education go beyond academy as well to include cultural competence, the ability to understand another person's culture and value, 
an important skill in today interconnected global society. For example, a VR field trips to other parts of the world, whether it is um, be in India or US, this will expose students to culture other than their own. If let's say we do not have enough travel fund. These combinations of interactivities and engagement with emotions in turn will enhance the ability of students to remember what they have learned and lead to faster equations of information and skill. Therefore, AR and VR can provide students with opportunities to deeper their knowledge within several areas, including reading, um, spatial concept, playing, content creation, which is the most important for designer, real life environments and scenario. Well, adopting AR, there's also um, no need for a complete curriculum redesign. It can be even more effective in we just supplement current pedagogical material by simply adding more contextual experience. It can be used to just stimulate interest and discussion in different subjects area and be the basic for class activities. The minimum AR setup for almost all class may include an internet connections, mobile device such as smartphone or tablets, um, AR apps, um, the best is tailored for educational purpose, um, triggers or marker for image, objects, locations, or actions that will you know, create or, or trigger an actions on the device via the AR apps. Educational AR apps provide opportunities for education educator to create their own AR contents and lesson plans, or even for those who would like to engage students in doing the same. For example, um, a arts, uh, I come across a case study that an art student in Brazil used a Rosma in conjunction with green screen apps to create an enhanced exhibition for visitor to their gallery. Through this experience, visitor actually could learn about the influence and technology behind each work by the way of video uh, featuring the artist, video that appear to come out from the artwork directly. So here is a list of uh, AR apps that provide tools to facilitate the creations of AR experience. Most of them are actually free to use, so y'all can explore it. And you know, um, I think one or two of them, you just need to pay like a $1 US dollar. So um, I have another video to show on how the AR works. <laughs> Builder enables anyone to easily construct imaginative and impactful augmented reality experiences that can be published and shared with the world at the touch of a button or a scan of a QR code. We've brought the power of Blip Builder to the Microsoft Teams ecosystem, so you can create, iterate, and review complex AR projects collaboratively. Once you're ready, you can publish and share your experiences with clients, colleagues, or the public. The possibilities are endless. Um, the other thing that I want to share is you can check out classvr.com for more resources if you're interested to incorporate um, AI and VR in your teaching and learning. So where do we um, go from here? Steve Heller have asked teacher and chairperson from uh, many art design school to answer these questions. Of the protocol currently in place have healthy and safety precautions during the pandemic. Example, hybrid learning, remote learning, which will be institute, which will be institute as a permanent technology. Um, I asked for design educations. I also pose the same questions to my colleagues who teach design and whole management positions in their design school. So what are the view of these design educator and chairperson from around the world? Almost all design faculty mentions that hybrid learning will be instituted as a permanent methodology for their school design. 
I really like what Peter got to say, uh, which is he's here today. I'm so happy that he's here today. I am going to cite him here. Many activities we used to do remain unchanged. What have changed is the shift in teaching and learning space. So means for physical to digital and mindset, which used to be less ideal to, you know, wherever that is possible. And getting used to the camera, you know, in case we are camera shy, um, um, talking in front of a camera for many students and instructor. Many of the teaching and learning practice uh, implemented in design education are now new in many, not, not new in many other disciplines. However, this pandemic has made design educator and administrator rethink and redesign the face-to-face -face design studio experience that used to dominate the design education pedagogy. And Peter um, um, asked us to explore how to turn studio classroom to free classroom, perhaps. Pre-recording mini lectures should be curated into on-demand bite-sized contents. This content can serve as pre-class pre or revisions material. The class time can be used for more meaningful discussions, design explorations, and also critiques. The use of online collaboration too such as Padlet, Miro, and online workspace such as Google Slide and Medium should be continued and treated as part of future design education experience. We all know that the future is both elusive and elusive concept. Who can predict the future, especially in today's complex and uncertain world? The last two years have illustrated this profoundly. And what of our design education's uh, future? What would that look like and how can we shape it? This is just the beginning for us design educators to explore the challenges we face. The first one, the challenges of adapting appropriate teaching and learning system. Hybrid learning and free classroom can be effectively to develop course contents, but need to be complements with a clear communication strategy and contextualize according to the local needs. Educational text has been key to keep learning, you know, um, in the time of lockdown, opening up new opportunity for developing educational at a large scale. However, the impact of technology on education remain a challenge. Also in this era, ongoing educators' professional developments is more critical than ever as well as the support for developing of digital and teaching tool for effective teaching in online and face-to-face -face, um, setting. But however, a lot of faculty might not have the time um, um, to upgrade themselves. If they have time, they will want to do maybe more research, produce more paper. And also the budget is one of the concerns for uh, some of the institutions. Lastly, Education is an intense human interactions endowment. For remote learning to be successful, it needs to be allowed for meaningful two-way interactions between students and instructors and among students themselves. Such interactions can be enabled by using the most appropriate technology for the local context. Is the way forward should be inclusive and participatory, where design thinking, you know, co-design came in, where student and instructor are at the heart of the process. With over 1.5 million uh, um, students affected by uh, learning in this uh, pandemic, with all the models of hybrid online learning and flipped classroom, it is time for us to critically and creatively conceptualize the potentials and the role of e-learning and virtual environment in these design educations. What can we learn from where we have progressed to now at this important moment in our educational history? What important questions need to be answered? Looking at technological enhanced learning in education as we learn and teach through and beyond COVID-19. Furthermore, what are the online and virtual opportunities that we can take advantage of now to envision and create design education future that are inclusive for as many students as possible. Thank you, EDD, uh, EDDE Design Conference for bringing us together to debate 
and share and envision the future of design education and how we can design effectively for innovative form of technology um, and enhanced learning for our future designer. I hope all of you all will enjoy these three days of conference and join in the discussions as well as reflect on what is the role of pedagogy, technolo um, technology, policy maker, educators and students in shaping learning space, experience and models post pandemic. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Jasmine, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, I definitely learned a few things here and there. I'm definitely really kind of behind in terms of technology. Uh, so uh, the way that we, we thought we could do this is to, uh, for our keynote speaker that uh, will ask the question for her uh, and for the rest of the presenters, uh, we'll keep that towards the end of it, uh, just to manage the time in a bit more uh, cohesive manner. So uh, with that, I'm opening it, that up to uh, all the attendees. Uh, if you guys have any questions for Dr. Yo. So there is a question in the in the chat. Oh, okay. And yes, I forget that uh, we are also using the chat feature to uh, ask questions. Um, uh, could you, can, can you can want you me to read it out? Sharing the screen? Yeah, Jasmine, if you want to stop share your screen share, okay. then we can just, yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, Ishan, do you want me to read the question out? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so Ishan uh, asks uh, that uh, SMAC seems an innovative approach, which can redefine faculty development programs, especially in a country like India with more than 250 plus design schools. So it's more of a statement rather than a question. Thanks, Ishan, for that. If Jasmine, if you want to just sort of say, if you need to say something on that, then. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah, SMAC is um, um, because of um, big data that we are looking into now. I guess, you know, uh, this is something that we all as a design educator need to understand as well in terms of um, um, like the course that I teach actually is really um, advanced in technology. Before the class, we have to really learn, uh, um, you know, um, the tech, you know, we have to spend like nearly two hours just to understand how the whole classroom uh, work actually. Um, but some faculty, because they are so uh, busy, they do not want to uh, turn up for the training as well. So I must say that, yes, uh, the statement is really uh, correct in a way that like SMAC is really uh, something forwards and what we need to uh, look into as well. Thank you. Anybody else, any questions? Okay, so I have a question, Jasmine, if I may, from a design educator perspective. I love the idea of a flipped classroom. I've tried it myself here in Toronto. Um, I just wanted to understand from your side, how do you manage the beyond the class time that the students are expected to give to a certain course? Like how much percentage of time do you see students giving to a course beyond, let's say if the course is uh, three hours, if the, if the class time is three hours, how much extra time would the students need to give outside of class to manage a flipped classroom well? You know what I mean in terms of getting uh, a grip on whatever material that has been given to them beyond the classroom? Okay, so you are referring to the flip classroom, isn't it? The flip classroom, absolutely, okay. yes. So I will say that uh, the video that we show every week um, um, depend on how many and depend on the topic. So for this week, for example, there's a total of four videos that show. So each of them took them around like um, less than 10 minutes. Um, ah, to okay. watch the video yeah so um, when you add up it's quite a bit but because it's into like small little videos and because mm -hmm. the quiz the questions is embedded in the video so they'll watch like halfway we ask a question so usually we have three points we are asked like a questions they stop think about it and answer it so you know it's instead of just watch the video for like 10 minutes they actually stop like maybe two three minutes to answer a question 
And doing the assignment itself is really not like a complete assignment. Um, is to really get them thinking of, you know, what we're going to discuss in class. Like, for example, this week, we asked them to come up with a positions paper, in a, like a leader, you know, you have mm -hmm. a positions uh, paper to present to the groups uh, together. Yeah. So maybe that took it quickly, I think half an hour um, um, is, is okay. like really to discuss, but not to submit. It's for their right. own reference. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Uh, we have another question, and uh, this is also from Sean, uh, and it is this. We are connected with 200 plus design schools where it is impossible to get good set of faculties. So can we, uh, let's say NTU plus IDC plus us, create uh, a accessible faculty development program online together? where faculties can upgrade themselves in their own time. It would be indeed a great initiative. So um, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Yo? Yeah. Casey, you're asking me? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> OK. Yes, uh, uh, I, I would say that is really a, a good uh, uh, um, kind of uh, suggestions in a sense. But, but we all know that um, the, the first question will be who to actually hold all the resources. You know, by holding the resources itself, it actually uh, costs a lot of money as well. And institutions, which institutions should hold it? And, and um, which institutions are willing to hold it? Uh, perhaps, but this is something that we could explore as, um, as something that um, for international uh, um, on an international and global scale. Recently uh, at NTU, um, we just have um, proposed um, a platform. We are still exploring how to do it. We're going to have a platform to connect um, industry people that wanted designer um, um, and uh, to find a good designer. So we're going to create the platform uh, hoeing in, in NTU. Um, we are talking to the library. Uh, we are, I'm not sure if this, this thing can work, perhaps what you suggest uh, could be done at NTU actually. I will try to propose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, if you guys are looking at the background where Jasmine is, uh, that is the School of Art, Design and Media. Uh, you know, literally you have uh, glass for uh, walls and grass for a uh, roof. Uh, that, that building costs 30 plus thousand dollars. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, 30 plus million dollars. Million. Yes, million. My numbers were messed up. Uh, and they built it really fast. I mean, Singapore definitely uh, has the initiative to really push for uh, this type of collaborative. Uh, um, and, you know, from our end here, uh, it, it would be, have, we have to go through uh, the mothership, which is in Bloomington. You know, we're part of uh, Indiana University. And um, I'm sure this is actually a great suggestion because that's kind of the whole purpose of putting this whole idea, this conference together, is to create collaboration, and sharing of ideas. And uh, really, thank you, uh, Ishan, for that wonderful suggestion. So let's see, who else have any other questions? Feel free to type those in the chat, or if you want Somebody to... had their hand up. Somebody um, did I have their it. hand I up. I had it. I just wanted to uh, add, add a comment that there is so much overlap in, uh, in what I see in this conference. You know, I come from the HCI background, from informatics, from interdisciplinary. And um, I, I also do a lot of uh, literacy research and STEM education research along with local schools. And I also serve on local boards other than being a university professor. So uh, I, I really like the presentation. I wanted to, to compliment you on that. I also wanted to say that there is so much uh, overlap with respect to uh, also teacher education in this case, when we are talking about PD, uh, we are transforming from a stage on a stage to more of a co-participant. And at some point of time, uh, the students that will be feeding into the system may be more technologically advanced than us. So it's also important to create a, a feedback loop where we also learn and adjust to the design changes. But uh, there are several ed tech companies that have actually come up in the last two years uh, in response to the pandemic that have come up with wonderful models that have been engaging students, uh, say, in ceramics, in clay art, 
uh, in design, in pencil sketches. Uh, so it's, it's an amazing time that we are in, and I really encourage us all to, to continue to collaborate the way we are. So thank you for creating this platform, and thank you for inviting us. And thank you for presenting. Appreciate it. Thank you. Perfect. Are there any other questions for Dr. I would be interested in knowing if there are any new in initiatives that, that you're working on, something that we probably will be the first to know if you're ready to share. Yes, uh, definitely. I'll, I'll, I'll first to share, you know, um, whether NTU is able to hold like a, you know, a, a, a robust kind of a platform for us to, you know, uh, um, um, put on resources for, for um, public to actually assess it as well. Yeah. I think this is really interesting because in a way that, you know, we are getting, we are reaching out to, you know, more people um, and the platform that I work on are reaching out, you know, trying to connect uh, professional designer with the industry people and, and also educator actually, yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many uh, students do you have participating in that program, uh, Jasmine? Which program? Freak Classroom? Uh, SMAC. Um, Freak Classroom, right? Uh, I'm talking about the, the SMAC. The SMAC? Yeah. Um, the SMAC as like, um, I'm, I'm using the platform itself. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, the Okay, I, I would say that um, the, the more, um, the one that uh, we use uh, a lot are uh, Miro actually, um, um, is we actually could hold on, hold up to um, the most, that time we have how many? Nearly 40 uh, uh, um, um, participants that actually use it uh, uh, together. But of course there's some chaos when, when we are actually using it. Um, um, when people do not know really how to use it, you know, uh, I still remember one of um, the participants have created like a um, post, post it pad, right, in a way, and that post it pad, pad is so big that it actually cover the whole uh, uh, um, um, artboard uh, of everybody, and then we uh, keep asking her to move, but she said, let me finish typing, we are all like, stay still and wait for her to finish typing you know um it's really interesting when we use new online platforms and things like that but i would say most of the uh, platform out there could hold up to uh many uh um participants for pet lab itself you you mean pet lab just now we use uh pet lab pet lab is the one that actually hold up to 160 students per time yeah at one time yeah i remember when uh when our school pushed everyone into using Zoom and at one point, Zoom crashed. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add on to that thing itself. I think that was a good question. How many students are there in the classroom? Because uh, apart from the premium students in India, where the number of intake is not more than 15 or 30, the majority of the design schools have 200 plus design students. And what you just said, even Zoom and platforms like this crash. And I think uh, flipped classroom kind of looks like something for the students who are very focused to learn. But we always have a bunch of students who, uh, <laughs> as, 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 as uh, faculty, we know that they are not that focused and all. So how, how we can actually sort out? I'm talking about those people that you're talking about who switch off their camera, you know. So uh, how to get the outcome out of them through online session? That also is a bigger challenge now. Okay, I'll, I'll say flipped classroom is a little bit different from uh, hybrid uh, uh, learning. For flipped classroom, right, most of the time discussions are in person. And it's only individual like in learning, uh, um, re, um, viewing the uh, videos and things like that uh, during their time that's online. So, you know, um, we do not have these issues when we use Freak Classroom. That's why uh, Freak Classroom was very favored by, you know, a lot of uh, educator 
comparing to uh, hybrid learning and things like that. As for, um, yes, uh, during COVID time, uh, the lockdown, I, I must say that most of the time when I ask the student to on their camera, they will say, oh, my camera is spoiled. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, I don't know what to do. So they will stay like, you know, uh, camera off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will say yes, most of the time. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but some of my uh, colleagues told me they love it because they, they just, you know, talk <laughs> and, you know, just uh, finish the uh, lecture in that way. You know, I, I always someone that want to look at people's face, like for, uh, for example, the presentation just now made me a little bit nervous in a sense is because I cannot, I cannot really see how y'all react to, you know, uh, what I have say and things like that. You know, when I can see the face reactions, I would like to add on or, or explain further or, you know, uh, go quick, uh, quicker and things like that. Yeah. I see that Srida has uh, his hand up. Uh, oh, yes, indeed. I was just going to share that, you know, to Ishan's question. Um, you know, these, these are things that we did face as educators in the last two years to get students to discuss, for introverts to be able to come out and talk. Um, so uh, what, what we had to do as, as to innovate is I started to use a lot of gamification and game-based learning. Uh, so that kind of brought people out. It also encouraged people to, to talk to each other. As long as, as far as the introverts ago, I think we had to do a lot of research with respect to understanding the personalities. So um, I, had to, I had to encourage and, and so I kind of flipped the, the uh, discussions in the classroom where the students had to find what mistake I'm making. I would make deliberate mistakes and they would like to pick that mistake out. And that really brings students back into the classroom. It's like finding faults with the instructor is fun. Uh, and I would deliberately introduce some things and then I would say, Mua, I, I, you know, you guys caught me. Uh, so uh, kind of changing the dynamics, becoming a co-participant, becoming a learning leader in the classroom. So it has been a transformative experience as far as, as being an educator. Uh, it's brought the youth back. Uh, in me because now I can I can interact and be the childish uh, uh, participant in the classroom, uh, but it it helps. It does bring the the participation back. Mm. Um, I'm actually interested to know uh, uh, what um um could you share more about your game based uh, learning? Sure, sure. So uh, one yeah, of the yeah. things I did was uh, how you, the usual classroom is where we we give students points for the homeworks that they do, right? So I changed the whole dynamic by saying, you all start with an A in the course. You all have 100 points. Now, if you make mistakes, you lose points. So the whole effort of gaining points changed to preserving points. So uh, every student starts with an A. That gives them a confidence in the, in the course. And then they have to strive to keep their points. So it's, it's instead of trying to impress me, they don't want to disappoint me. You see, it's a psychological shift. They don't want to lose points, so they fight back to get keep their points. They ask for uh, resubmission attempts. They ask for, how can I get these points back? I want to stay uh, in, in the A that I am in. So I changed the dynamics in a way by changing the way we grade. Uh, so they, they, you know, they start with, uh, with 100 in the assignment, and then they lose points. Uh, based. So it's, it's like a game. And then I, I also give them a way out in the sense, if they collect enough points during the semester, uh, they can take the final exam sooner than others and thereby be done with the course earlier. So I give them way outs where I can see people who are in different mastery paths uh, can have an early exit. And uh, that has helped the high achievers in the classroom who really don't want to be bogged down or slowed down by the other students. So I give them multiple pathways uh, to, to success. Uh, so that, that, that's some of the things I tried in the last couple of years, and it has worked for me so far. Uh, but it's 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 a ticking time bomb, you know. Soon they will outsmart me, and I'll have to come up with new ideas. <laughs> so uh, wonderful review. Uh, so with that, um, we want to move on to our first presenter. So uh, a big thank you so much to our uh, keynote speaker today this morning. And so. Uh,